Hi, my name is Bill Himmelstein. I'm the founder and CEO of Tenant Advisory Group. I've been investing in, in, in brokering real estate now for over 25 years. And that's what we're going to talk about on today's show is where do we see opportunities? Where might there be some challenges? And what are the best asset classes to invest in? So please join us. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owners Association, where real estate investors have found success since 1968. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 455. My guest today has been a commercial broker for over 23 years, representing businesses as they lease, buy, and sell office, industrial, medical, cannabis, and retail space. He's also part of a team developing over $150 million in hotels across the country. And today, he's going to delve into the dynamic world of commercial real estate and share his unique perspective and insights on leasing and investing in today's market. Bill Himmelstein has been featured in magazines, he's won numerous awards, and he's a seasoned real estate investor. Bill, welcome to the show. Brian, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Tell us a little bit about yourself because you're you're not just a broker, you're an investor, and it sounds like you do a lot of interesting things in real estate. First of all, I, I think of myself as a husband and father. I've got two young boys and they're just so much fun. But I was very fortunate growing up that my father who himself was an entrepreneur and a very avid real estate investor, really took my older brother and I under his wing and taught us what we needed to know and pointed us in the right direction and, and really shared with us just the sort of wealth creation that can be accomplished through real estate investing. So I've been very fortunate ever since I was a child to really have received that education from my parents. and. Both my brother and I have continued that, we'll call it a family tradition now, of continuing to invest into real estate, which is something I greatly enjoy. Tell us what that looks like for you. I mean, because you've got different hats that you wear as a broker and an investor. Talk about balancing those and, and what each involves. When I talk about my revenue generating activity, my, my, my day job, if you will, is I founded a commercial brokerage firm in 2008, July of 2008. World was crumbling around us, right? And it uh, didn't seem like a great time to be starting a business, but I knew that I was great at being a broker. But really, what's passionate, you know, what, what, what my passion is, Brian, is if I earn a commission in my brokerage business, I know that if I don't invest that money, then ultimately it's just going to be spent, right? We're going to spend it on the business, we're going to spend it on my family. The money is going to be gone eventually. However, when I have the opportunity to make a real estate investment, now that's something that really gets me excited and gets, gets my juices flowing. And, and, and that's what I really look forward to. And predominantly, I'll, I'll tell you one interesting thing, Brian, is over the course of my, let's call it 25, maybe 26 years of investing into real estate, my asset classes and preference in what I want to invest in has remained the same over that 25, 26 years, including through the pandemic until today. Number one, my most favorite asset class to invest in, multifamily residential. Number two is typically multi-tenant industrial or warehouse properties. I'm also happy with single-tenant properties of the same caliber. After that, it will be medical. After that, then it's going to get down uh, and a ways below that is going to be retail and office. And I always say with investing in retail or office space, you really have to kind of win with the purchase. You got to win on the purchase, meaning you got to buy for a great price. You got to have an opportunity to fill up some vacancy because that's where you're going to create a lot of value, certainly in those two types of investments. But that's really kind of been my preference and my priority throughout the last 
quarter century. Break it down for us. Like you, you mentioned all those different asset classes. You know, why is it that multifamily is number one for you? Why multi-tenant industrial? Like, tell us what the compelling factors are for those. By the way, I, I want to make sure your listeners, uh, my word is not gospel, right? I have been wrong before, but this is what has worked for me. This is what I look for. And this is why I have listed these different asset classes in order. Let's start at the top. Multifamily residential real estate, in my opinion, you have a lot of, if, again, if you can buy at the right price, you have a lot of room for error. And that error could be vacancy. It could be you're doing a renovation project that either stretches long, on a longer time frame or above budget. But the fact is, is a lot of times you can buy a multifamily property. And I'm talking, you know, not, I don't really invest in three, four, five, six units. It's really more, it might be 30, 50, 100 units or more. And I'm just a, a limited partner. So I'm buying a small percentage. I don't own the whole. The whole property, but you know, you could have 25% vacancy in these multifamily residential properties and still be covering all your expenses, right? Maybe you get to 80% occupancy, 85%. Now you're cash flow positive and you get to pay out money to your investors. One of my favorite things with real estate investments is the passive income that it can generate. And it's passive for me because I'm not managing the project, right? It wouldn't be passive. If you're actually managing the day to day, then you're, I would call that active income. But earning those monthly checks from the additional amount that is not needed to cover expenses like debt service and maintenance, that's really exciting for me. I really enjoy that. And so I feel like residential real estate, multifamily residential real estate, in my opinion, provides for the most amount of leeway. And then, secondarily, Brian, predominantly what I'm investing in is what I would called Class B real estate. And the reason why I find a lot of comfort in Class B is that when times are great and the economy's you know, hitting on all cylinders and everybody's making money and doing well, a lot of people might move from their Class B residential property up to a Class A. However, there's also going to be folks from Class C properties that might upgrade to the Class B. And the same thing is true in the reverse when the economy is not doing well and people aren't uh, feeling as wealthy as they'd like to. Same thing is going to happen. Class B occupiers, residents might downgrade to a class C for something more affordable, but same thing, class A's are going to be coming into that B space. So I find a lot of stability in that class B multifamily sector. That's why I'm predominantly in there. Where primarily are you investing in the in the country and, and what size? It's predominantly been focused on the Midwest. I grew up in Kansas City and a lot of the firms that originate these uh, opportunities are based out of Kansas City. But those firms have been spreading their wings to other Midwestern markets like Omaha, Nebraska, Grand Rapids, Michigan you know, other cities in Michigan and Ohio and other, other spots in the Midwest. Deal size could be anywhere from maybe $5 million on the low end up to $30, $40 million on the high end. But again, this is, I'm not writing a check for these. I'm, I'm just buying a sliver, just a piece of the deal. You're investing as a limited partner in these? That's correct. Given that, because there's been, you know, multifamily and apartments has really been a great investment vehicle since 2008 when you started your brokerage but it's had its ups and downs in the past 4 years yeah what are you seeing in your portfolio with the multifamily is it surviving thriving how how's it doing i would say in general we're doing well you know we're maintaining occupancy which is incredibly important no matter what type of asset you're buying is you got to have a tenant in there that's able to pay your expenses but a lot of the projects are including some type of a value add. And by that, I mean, they're going to come into each unit and spruce them up, maybe get new countertops, new appliances, new carpet, new paint. They're, they're making the units nicer so they can charge more in rent. And when you can charge more in rent, typically your net operating income or your NOI is going to increase. A lot of times after they've 
spruced up all the units and they've increased the rents, they're able to go back and refinance because the value of that property has gone up because you've increased the NOI. So now all of a sudden with a refinance, you're able to pull out 20, 30, 40% of the equity and you get that back, but you still own the same percentage. So those are really fun and interesting projects for me. And given the times that we're in now, those, those kind of value add opportunities have been very productive. But Brian, the groups I'm invested in have, you know, they're finding opportunities to purchase, but we've also been sellers the last few years as valuations have gone up, even though we've seen interest rates grow up, which tend to have your NOI go down because you've got higher expenses related to the debt service. We've been able to sell at some, some really strong valuations, but my plan with any sale is to try and 1031 it, meaning to avoid the capital gains taxes, you can take your proceeds from that sale and put it into a new property within a certain time frame, so you're able to basically roll over your gains into a new property. If you're investing as a limited partner, though, doesn't that make it a little more tricky to, to do a 1031 because they, the sponsors of that deal would have to be the sponsors of the 1031? You're spot on, Brian. And what they've typically done is they'll give each individual investor the choice whether they want to move on or not to roll it over 1031. However, anyone who chooses not to, they'll go out and, and raise capital and they're able to, I, I guess, do the right accounting on it to make it work, even if they lose certain investors that are rolling it over. So I've always had the opportunity to make the choice whether I want to roll it over or not. And I think it does make it a little bit more challenging for the originator of the deal. Absolutely. Tell us why you love uh, multi-tenant industrial and warehouse. One of the nice things about my top priority, the, the, the two top investment classes, res multifamily residential, and then the industrial and warehouse, whether it's single or multi-tenant, is that typically it doesn't take a whole lot of capital to bring in new tenants. That's why the opposite of that is why office is my least favorite investment because that is incredibly capital intensive with tenant improvement allowances and leasing commissions, chunks of free rent that you got to give out. But when you're talking about industrial and warehouse, oftentimes you're buying a building with these existing tenants. So there's no commissions that you're paying anybody other than on the purchase of the property. You're not paying for any tenant improvement allowances. And even if you have to get a new tenant to fill a space, in general, across the country, tenant improvement allowances for industrial and warehouse properties are, for the most part, relatively minimal. Commissions are lower on a per square foot basis than they are in office space. The need for capital in the industrial and warehouse is smaller than it is for office. So that's one reason why I like those types of of investments. Also, the stability of the, of the tenant. In warehouse and industrial, you're typically getting a relatively stable business, hopefully, right? That's the goal. That's been around for a long time. They've been in the property for a long time. And that's where they're hopefully going to remain in your property for a long time. So of course, you always got to do your due diligence on the tenants and understand who your, you know, who your tenants are. But in general, you know, these warehouse and industrial deals provide a pretty stable, steady return and without a lot, a, a huge capital investment besides buying the building, of course. So that's why I'm interested in those opportunities as well. Can you put on your, your broker hat now and talk about kind of <laughs> put on the, a different hat here? And let's talk about just the state of the market that as you see it as you see it happening right now. And, and but I, I'd really like you to start with kind of retail and office because you put those at the bottom of your list for what you would invest in as an investor. The office market right now, and this is pretty much nationwide, is challenging. If you are an owner of a property or you are a lender on a property, you're probably not sleeping super well. On the one hand, We've seen a, what we call a flight to quality. Those class C tenants have moved to class B. The class Bs have moved to class A. And 
the least struggling asset class among office space is the class A properties, but they're still not nearly as profitable as they were because there's still a huge upfront investment for every tenant you bring on. A lot of these landlords, they don't even break even until year three or later of a new lease signing. So it's a very difficult business, plus layer on top of that, What we've seen in the office sector since the beginning of the pandemic is overall a drastic reduction in the amount of space each individual business needs, whether it's the flexible work policy and work from home, or it's spreading out of the workforce across the country. There's less and less of that, you know, this is where our headquarters is, and everyone's coming into the office five days a week. I don't know if we're ever going back to five days a week in the office as a general rule of thumb. Clearly, some companies are able to do it, but a lot of companies struggling with it because if you ask your people to come in more than they are, they might have two or three other job offers waiting for them that are remote. So they can just say, hey, if you make me come in, I'm going to leave to this other company where they allow me to keep my flexibility. Now, on the retail side, what we've seen has been very interesting in the sense that I haven't seen a huge change in vacancy rates overall from pre-pandemic to now. What we've really seen is a difference in how retail space is used. Prior to the pandemic, a lot of retail was customers would go to a store to buy a product, right? You go to buy sporting goods, you go to buy whatever your product is that you're purchasing. But a lot of that purchasing power has shifted to online, which is why there's been a greater demand for warehouse space. But what, the, what has maintained, I guess, a steady vacancy rate for retail has been a change in the way that we use retail space, which now is more about experiential real estate for retail. You go in to climb a wall, to throw an axe, to exercise, to get a massage, to get your hair hair done, your nails did, whatever, you know, doctor visits. There's a lot more medical now in retail than in medical office spaces. And so we've, for retail since the pandemic, we've really just kind of seen an evolving way in which the retail space is used. And, And as I said, it's much more experiential based where you're going to do something at a retail location versus purchasing a product. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is health care for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole health care insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best health care options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. And when you look at what's moving in the market, what's being bought, what's being sold, now, what ass- asset classes are hot right now? What are just dead in the water? Predominantly, I think the fastest moving hottest asset class, in my mind, is the industrial and warehouse sector. And there's been some interesting statistics that are floating around, whether people are saying it's hot, it's cooling. There's, in my mind, with the both the industrial and warehouse sector, there's kind of this divide 
between huge big box, 500,000 square feet, million square foot properties that have been being built at an incredible pace, certainly in towards the middle of 2022, all through 2023. It has slowed down in 2024, but those huge big box developments are predominantly for Fortune 500 companies like Kimberly Clark, Procter & Gamble, Target, Amazon, these huge users that are finally starting to get caught up and say, okay, we have the right amount of space. We don't need any more 500,000 million square foot warehouses. Yes, they're still getting them, but at a much slower pace. Where I'm seeing a tremendous amount of tightness in the market, which means a very, very low vacancy rate, anywhere from, depending on where you are in the country, could be anywhere as low as 2% up to 4 or 5%, which historically is still very low, is in these spaces where you've got 20,000 to 80,000 or up to 100,000 square feet of that industrial and warehouse space. That's all the just Main Street America businesses, right? Your mom and pop where they've got the one location where they're either building something or storing something. It's an incredibly tight market that's moving incredibly fast, whether it's on the leasing side or the in purchasing and sales side. There's very low vacancy opportunities that do arise, move very quickly, and it's just an incredibly tight market. But that, in my mind, it's it's separate from the big, you know, million square foot spaces, which they're all together in the same statistics. But I do, I do think those numbers are a little bit deceiving based upon, you know, how much space you as a business owner are looking for. What do you see that is not moving right now where there might be some opportunity? Office space. I, 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 I hate to keep kicking this sector while it's down, but banks don't want to lend on office space. Even if you're an owner occupier taking more than 51% of the property, or even if you're taking the entire property as an occupier, an uh, owner occupier, banks are still a little fearful. They see all the at risk loans they have in their portfolio. You know, we're already seeing a higher rate of foreclosures, deed in lieu of foreclosures. And when they look at their portfolio of loans in the office sector, they're seeing more troubled loans on the horizon. As these loans come to maturity and they come up for refinancing at a much higher interest rate than they were before, some of these buildings aren't going to be able to meet their debt service. And so I look at that as the most sluggish sector that's in the most hot water that's going to have the most trouble. And I see this coming for, I guess, it all relies on one man, and his name is Jerome Powell. If he can bring our interest rates down to where they were before the, these, these hikes, maybe that could salvage the office sector. Otherwise, what we're going to see happen, Brian, is as these buildings get foreclosed on and, and the, the keys get handed back you know, to the, to the lenders, they don't want to hold on to these properties. They want to sell them as fast as they can and get them off their books take the write off and move on. So we're going to start seeing these buildings retrade at and we're already starting to see this. These buildings are retrading at a far lower valuation than they did the previous time they traded hands. I'm talking 50, 60, sometimes even 70% lower than they were the, than they traded the previous sale. So as that starts to happen and these buildings are purchased at a much lower valuation, that means these new owners can charge much lower rental rates. So as we see kind of a re a repositioning of the of the office market and the value of the buildings are going to be dropping, the rental rates are going to be coming down right along with it. So it's going to be a while before this happens, but right now I think the the main thing I can say is that if you own an office property or are a lender on an office property, you're not sleeping well and I and I feel for you. This is a crystal ball question, but is now the time to get in and start finding some of these, these bargains or are you just catching a falling knife? I don't want anyone to listen to my advice right here, but 
I'm a contrarian as well. You know, a lot of people have done really well investing on the downswing. Do I think we're at the bottom? I can't answer that. Do I think we're near the bottom? That I can be very confident and say, yeah, I think we've come a long way from the top. I can't imagine that there's a tremendously long way to keep falling. So yeah, I think you got to have a a real thick stomach. You got to have, you got to be a risk taker, but I do think that there are opportunities and we are seeing that. I mean, here in Chicago, across the Midwest, all over the country, Brian, we are seeing people, real estate investors, REITs, pension funds, we're seeing people open it up to the idea of saying, hey, this property was worth $400 million pre-pandemic. Now it's on the market for $170 million. Boy, there can't be too much downside there, but potentially a lot of upside risk. The one thing I would, something I learned from John Buck, who's a prominent developer here in Chicago, you know, if you're not building the building yourself, you're going to buy an existing property. Make sure that property is, is quite empty because that's where your upside is going to be. It's filling up the property with tenants, increasing the cash flow, and then exiting. But office in general, in my opinion, is a very tough place to make money, mainly because of the cost and the capital requirements needed to keep that property going. Every time you sign a new tenant, huge tenant improvement allowance, large leasing commissions, which I'm very thankful for, huge chunks of free rent. You know, it's, it just, it almost feels like if you buy a, an office property that's 90% occupied, you're, you're kind of clipping coupons with a, a one, two percent gain. And I look at that as just being on a treadmill because every time you lose a tenant, now you got to backfill that space with a huge capital expenditure. If you can buy these office properties at a steep discount and confidence that you can backfill some of that space, I think there's opportunities to do very well. Am I investing in any office properties right now? I don't have that thick of a stomach. I, personally, I'm just not interested. But again, I said at the beginning of this podcast, you, a lot of these investments, you can do well with the purchase. So if you're getting a great purchase price, it could be worth considering. Absolutely. When people look back two years from now at this period where you know, hopefully in September, and we're in September, actually, Jerome Powell will start lowering interest rates. The market will kind of heat up again. Some people are, are thinking, you know, two years from now, what will people say, oh, I should have bought in, and, and this is the asset class I should have been buying? It's probably office space. I mean, I really think that could be our greatest opportunity. I also think it still comes with a decent amount of risk. You know, if the labor market stays strong, then they will have the leverage to continue to demand that they get to work from home at least some portion of the time. And the more that our employee base is remote or hybrid, the longer it's going to take for the office sector to recover. Now, you can see that there's there's talk, and it's usually mostly talk, it's very little action about converting office space to residential. The reason why it's mostly talk and not as much action is because it's extremely capital intensive. A lot of times those floor plates, if they're larger, 25,000 feet or more, they don't lay out well for a residential unit because there's too much interior space and not enough of that coveted window line that all of us living in our houses or apartments really strive to get. But if we can see office buildings, and there's going to be a lot of pain in, in, in the retrenching, right? In the foreclosures and the deed in lieu of foreclosures, that's how we're going to see the office market reset to a much lower valuation. When these rates can really drop down and start being significantly lower than they are today or were at the beginning of the pandemic, I think we'll see businesses be more open to taking more space than they think they need with the hopes that they can get their people to come back. But I do feel that the office sector will create the greatest opportunity for upside right now. That's my belief. 
where would people go to find out more about you or get a hold of you? Our website is a great resource. It's www.tagcommercialbroker.com. My email address, I, I, would, I respond to every email I get, even if it's to say no thank you to a salesperson. It's bill at tagcommercialbroker.com. Those are the two best ways to reach us is check out our website or, or email me directly. What is your favorite hack or app? I'll tell you where I've found a lot of success. And that's in asking clients or prospect the question, how can I best support you right now? Simple question. And it's not necessarily about how can my product or service support you right now. It's what can I do for you? How can I be supportive of you right now? Because that takes you from being a vendor hey, buy my product or service to being a partner. How can I, how can I benefit you right now? So that's my, that's my greatest hack is to try and ask people what you can do for them rather than what they can do for you. I appreciate you coming on the show today too, to kind of give us a round the world tour of the different asset classes in the commercial space, both what you're investing in and what you're bullish on, and then where you see the distress. And that's office, but also possibly the greatest potential. Great insight. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for being on the show today. It was my honor, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com.